Uh, for the full certificate, please, uh, at the end of the course, uh, uh, fill the uh, MCQs and for the all uh, certificate at the end of this uh, webinar series, uh, you need to complete 80% of this uh, participation uh, MCQs. And the uh, question and the answer will be at the end. And uh, please, uh, Jeff, uh, Jeff Blunt is our co-chair on the Education Committee, can introduce a little bit membership committees and uh, ISPN. Thanks, Jeff. Well, thank you, Nelsi, and welcome to everyone. We have a robust program this morning that focuses on a lot of developmental issues surrounding brain malformations, cysts, and things of this nature. We have a great series of talks and lectures for you. We want to remind you about the guide that is available, the ISPN guide that has um, been up and a free resource available, and it is being reworked, so it will be getting you know, more useful and better. Uh, Maria, Noor, I'm going to introduce you to introduce our speakers. We've changed our order a little bit because this is a surgical meeting and surgeons do surgery and Albert needs to do a surgery. So that's the real world of surgery intervening. So we will change our order a little bit and the rest, uh, Maria and Noor will, uh, will take us through. Thank you so much, sir. It's a matter of real honor and privilege for me to have this chance of uh, being here and uh, organizing this all this amazing meeting with all with the legends like you, all of them. So thank you so much. I would like to uh, invite our first speaker, Dr. Albert Cho, who is assistant professor at the University of Ottawa, and um, he's a very active pediatric neurosurgeon. Um, he has graduated from the University of British Columbia. After that, he completed his fellowship with the Children's Hospital Los Angeles in California. He initially started his career as a pediatric neurosurgeon at Children's uh, Hospital Minnesota before returning to Canada and establishing a practice at Children's Hospital Eastern Ontario at the University of Ottawa. He's an active member and involved in several important um, research works and uh, other projects and, and also in the several of our organizations. He's also voluntarily managing several of the websites and keeping us all updated. So it's a matter of huge uh, pleasure for me to invite him uh, to deliver his um, lectures to start his lecture right now. Dr. Albert Cho, um, yeah, <laughs> the floor is all yours now. Um, th thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Noor. That, that's, uh, oh, wow, that's, uh, that's very flattering. Uh, thank you, Nelsi, and thank you, Jeff, for, uh, for setting this up and uh, allowing me to, to share. Uh, I'm going to try sharing my screen again, and uh, hopefully this time it works. Just to confirm everyone sees there you go. Talk. Perfect. Perfect. So uh, I'm going to get right into it. So I'll be talking about uh, management and surgical indications for um, hydrocephalus and, and cysts. And uh, I have no disclosures. Um, my objective today will be just to talk very briefly about hydrocephalus. I feel like this is a topic unto itself, and I will try to just cover it very, very briefly. And I'll try to talk about the relationship of hydrocephalus and cysts as well as some of the management options and approaches that we, that we sometimes employ. Um, so very briefly, hydrocephalus, by technical definition, just means water in the head. But from a working standpoint and from a practical standpoint, it really refers to when we have a disorder in typical CSF circulation. You know, be it that there's too much CSF being made, CSF can't circulate through the normal space it's supposed to be, can't exit the ventricles, can't get out of the cisterns, or can't be reabsorbed. And the end result is that that CSF builds up and you have increased intracranial pressures. This schematic just very briefly shows you know, that pathway of how CSF is made and where it goes to and how it gets out. And as you can imagine, any perturbation, any disruption in this sort of movement of fluid, and it doesn't have to be a complete interruption, maybe even just a partial disruption in that balance between fluid being made, of circulating and getting reabsorbed, any, any imbalance at all will result in fluid being built up. And when we talk about intracranial cysts in this context, and I, I just wanna clarify, I'm only gonna talk about the ones that are really based around CSF and cerebral spinal fluid. You know, we can get cysts from brain tumors, we can get cysts from infections and other things as well. And those are a little bit different. The natural history and the treatments for those are a little bit different. So we'll try to focus on just the ones that are 
focused around CSF. Uh, these cysts can occur anywhere in the brain. Um, they can be in the ventricle or outside the brain. You can be born with them, a congenital cyst, like an arachnoid cyst, which is where I'll talk mostly today. Or you can develop them over time, you know, such as in the case when you get an infection, you get some scarring, or you get a hemorrhage in the brain, you get some scarring afterwards. And these cysts can make you sick in a number of different ways. They can enlarge over time. They can cause some pressure, seizures, not super common, but it can happen. Or they can cause indirect dysfunction by potentially obstructing the normal circulation of CSF. If we look at arachnoid cysts specifically, basically any sort of pocket of CSF that's surrounded by arachnoid it doesn't have to be a full bubble. Sometimes it's just loculations. Um, these are the most common congenital CSF cysts in the head. And if we talk about arachnoid cysts specifically, the result of a duplication of some sort of, uh, of arachnoid membrane, usually before you're born, you know, some, some point during fetal development. And the most common location that we see is in the middle cranial fossa, uh, but they can occur really anywhere, you know, commonly in the posterior fossa, sometimes supracellar, but most common is in the middle cranial fossa. Um, I'm just gonna put this out there right now, and this may be a little bit controversial. Most of these don't need to be treated. I'd say the vast majority of them don't need to be treated. And if they do need treatment, it really is dictated by the presenting symptoms. When we look at, uh, these are some patients of mine. Uh, these are two separate patients. Um, if you go, uh, if you look at the top left patient, this is a patient with a left-sided arachnoid cyst. Pretty impressive, pretty scary. Uh, this patient was being worked up for what sounds like chronic migraine headaches. And I can tell you with pretty comfortable confidence that this cyst did not cause any of the patient's migraine headaches. The uh, patient uh, below, uh, you see a left-sided arachnoid cyst, uh, same thing, the patient's being worked up for headaches. And again, these, these cysts, this cyst did not cause the patient's headaches. It's been followed for a number of years. Uh, both these patients have been followed for a little while and they have not progressed, they haven't changed. Symptoms have actually gotten better. These are the kind of cysts that we don't typically intervene on if we don't think the symptoms are related to the cyst. And again, I'm going to really harp on this point. If patients are having symptoms, um, then we will treat them. And, you know, it is important to do a proper evaluation, look for deficits, uh, excuse me, focal neurologic deficit. You can look for uh, signs of CSF outflow obstruction. And in our world, the pediatric world, one of the first signs might be a really big head or signs of increased intracranial pressure. A really good and a really good test that we often can do is looking for signs of chronic increased intracranial pressure. Uh, which may be demonstrated um, by finding papilledema. Um, the picture on your left is a picture of what we should see when we look in the back of the eyes. And the picture on the right is someone who's actually got quite severe stage three papilledema, signs of chronic elevated intracranial pressure. Um, these are all cases of mine, uh, real patients, just to give you an example of what you might see. So a nine month old male presented to my clinic uh, referred as an outpatient and really is for workup for a bulging fontanelle and a big head. And the patient is having episodic irritability, arching of his back, just an unwell baby. Got an ultrasound, which if you look at the picture on the left, that's a coronal view of the ventricles. And the picture on the right is a sagittal view. On the coronal view, we appreciate that the ventricles uh, highlighted by the little stars, the fluid spaces are big. Those the black spaces are bigger than they should be. And if we look on the picture on the left, there's a hint that there's something there going on in the posterior fossa. When we get an MRI scan, we see now that, I hope, I hope it's clear that there's an abnormality in the posterior fossa. There's a big CSF pocket when there shouldn't be there. And on the picture on the right, we can see that the ventricles have been quite enlarged. When we look at the sagittal view, I think this gives us a very good appreciation of how a cyst potentially can cause symptoms, how it can cause issues. You know, we know that this is an arachnoid cyst based on our imaging. And this arachnoid cyst has essentially displaced the, the posterior fossa contents. Um, you can see that the tonsils have been squashed down into the foramen magnum. And you can see that the, where uh, on the hatched line, there, is a, there should be an aqueduct. You can see that aqueduct has become funneled and compressed. You know, essentially the, the posterior fossa arachnoid cyst has displaced the, con the posterior fossa contents anteriorly and obstructed the aqueduct, causing obstructive hydrocephalus. So what do you do? How do we treat these? How do we manage this? There's a million ways to skin a cat. On lots of different options we have. There's surgical options, which I, which I like. Um, there's, you can poke a hole in the cyst. You can do this open with a microscope. You can do this with an endoscope. Uh, you can do CSF diversion. You know, this patient is hydrocephalus. If you don't want to treat the cyst directly, you can always shunt the ventricles. Even if you want to 
treat the cyst directly, you can shunt that. Um, when we talk about CSF, CSF diversion, there's options where we shunt, where we take the fluid extracranially, or you can do an intracranial diversion, which would be like poking a hole in that fluid space and trying to get it to communicate with somewhere else. Uh, for this patient, I elected to do an intracranial uh, fenestration, an endoscopic procedure, and I'll try to guide you through the pictures briefly. Uh, the picture in the top left is us actually looking back at the posterior fossa cyst. Um, there's a little sort of score mark where we've started to kind of poke into the cyst. Uh, the picture on the top right is us actually having made a hole in the cyst and now reorienting, uh, showing the relationship of this cyst wall relative to the aqueduct. That's the hole in the top right corner. And the bottom left picture is us actually looking through the cyst into the posterior fossa. And the bottom right is actually full on us looking into the posterior fossa, getting a really nice view of the posterior fossa structures. And when we look at our post-operative MRI scan, we go from, excuse me, the pre-operative MRI is the picture on the left, post-operative is the picture on the right. And the arrow is highlighting essentially a flow void, showing that there's good flow of fluid now egressing out of the posterior fossa. Um, I, I hope that you can appreciate as well that the posterior fossa contents seem to be less displaced anteriorly, have now sort of have more space to expand out. And we can see now an aqueduct and potentially some fluid flow out of the posterior fossa into the, uh, 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 into the spinal subarachnoid space as we expected to. Uh, another patient of mine, uh, this patient was referred um, at one day of life. And uh, they're born term, but they, when they were born, they were noticed to have very, very significant macrocephaly. I mean, like massive head, big bulging fontanelle, very irritable, and really no sort of prenatal care had been provided to this patient. And uh, when we get an MRI scan, we can see that there's very clearly um, a very large ventricle. And if we look actually more carefully at the, at the image on the right, we can appreciate that within this ventricle, there appears to be actually loculation, suggestive actually of a cyst within the ventricle or perhaps a ventricle, which isn't communicating with the rest of the CSF system. Um, and again, in this case, you know, I, we elected for a intracranial diversion, you know, basically try to recommunicate that CSF space. You know, shunting is always an option. You can always try to drain that fluid extracranially, but in this case, we thought that a, an intracranial attempt would be reasonable at first. And uh, the picture on the left is us looking down at the uh, septum. And uh, the picture on the right is actually actually having opened up the septum uh, to allow for CSF to flow from one side to the other. Um, the preoperative pictures are the pictures on the left and the postoperative on the right. And it's subtle, and, but I, I, I have a radiologist report that says that the ventricles are actually smaller after the surgery. And this patient actually has continued to do well. Uh, clinically, they become much less irritable, they're starting to hit their milestones, and they're doing, very, they're doing good from a clinical perspective. Um, but, you know, like any surgery, there's always risks. Um, you know, it's one of the downsides of potentially doing surgery, um, especially when you're treating congenital cysts, compression of the cyst, drainage of the cyst, because it's a big, potentially congenital cavity. You know, when you drain these cysts, sometimes you get a big displacement, you tear a blood vessel that that space stays open and there's nothing potentially to tamponade that bleeding, you can get a hemorrhage into a cavity in the, or uh, onto the convexity, which is never a good thing. And sometimes you may inadvertently treat a patient who actually doesn't have symptoms. And that's always a big, big challenge because you may give patients a problem they didn't have before. Um, this is a patient uh, also now mine. Um, they were a 14 year old male, they were, had chronic headaches, but otherwise doing okay. And at some point in their life, uh, for workup of their headaches, they were found to have an arachnoid cyst. It's the placement of a shunt into the cyst. Uh, you know, uh, initially, the patients thought maybe they got better for a few days, but you know, over time, they felt that they were getting these new headaches. And uh, when they finally saw me about six months later, the headaches had been very clearly defined as uh, every time he would sit up, he'd get a raging headache. And then every time he'd lie down, the headaches would get quite a bit better, but not quite go away completely. Uh, this image on the left is the preoperative pictures, and the image on the right is the postoperative pictures um, from the outside center. Uh, you can see that in the interim, there's been a cyst placed into what looks like a middle cranial fossa arachnoid cyst. Um, the cyst looks like it's shrunk down a little bit, but it's still there. Um, and this is a very, these potentially can be very challenging patients because, you know, we don't really know what the problem is. It sounds like this patient has a pretty classic clinical syndrome of intracranial hypotension, um, but we don't know if that's because they've, they're over shunted. We don't know if it's because they 
never needed a shunt and now they're, they are being shunted. Um, you know, we, you always have to check the shunt and the shunt was working. Um, we tried to wean the patient off the shunt, but you know, unfortunately it looks like they now become shunt dependent. They needed the shunt to drain their, their CSF. Um, and eventually we were able to put in a programmable valve, an adjustable one that allows us to not always have to replace the valve. We were able to adjust it percutaneously. And over time, by increasing the resistance to a point where we felt like we got a balance point between enough fluid out, but not too much, the patient became intracranially, excuse me, had a low pressure headache, uh, they were able to get them home and, and actually do reasonably well. Um, so I hope that I've covered very briefly, very quickly, and I hope it wasn't, uh, I hope that the, some of it came across. Um, but my main points are that uh, these cysts are, most of the CSF cysts we see are incidental and they don't need any intervention. Um, and if you do need intervention, if they do need some sort of treatment, it's really dependent on the problems that they may cause. You know, if we're talking in the context of hydrocephalus, you know, there's a, many ways to treat it, but potentially you can treat the hydrocephalus by treating the cyst itself. And when you're treating the cyst, a number of options, but fenestration of a cyst, communication of a cyst back into the CSF space is actually a viable option. Um, I know we're saving questions to the very end, um, but I thought I'd leave you with this quote. And uh, thank you again, Nelsie, uh, Jeff, and the rest of the committee for allowing me to share today. Thank you very much. Very nice presentation, Albert. It was very practical, and I think it raises a big issue. Cysts are difficult, and cysts are controversial as a result. There are a couple of questions in the question and answer uh, that maybe we should um that we should look at first. Uh, let's see, there's one, uh, the second one let's take first. In a young woman recently incidentally diagnosed with a CT, sounds like a truly incidental lesion, an arachnoid cyst in the posterior fossa with no neurologic deficit. Would you send that person for fundoscopy? And the same patient, what follow-up would you want if the fundoscopy didn't drive you to action? That's the question in the question and answer. Oh, that, that's a fantastic question. I think that's a, a little bit controversial one. Um, I think the standard of care in my institution and uh, what I personally think is that I do send every patient with a posterior fossa arachnoid cyst for fundoscopy um, simply to make sure that it's not that they don't have signs of elevated ICP that I can't detect on my clinical exam. I mean, I think that my expectation is that they would complain of headaches and symptoms, and then that would trigger me to, to, uh, to definitely send for, uh, for um, uh, to evaluate for venoscopy. But in patients who say are very young, you know, for example, an infant or maybe a young child who can't express symptoms of a headache, I think it's even more important to make sure that they do get venoscopy. Uh, the simple answer is I, I send every patient I see uh, just as a standard of care. Um, and sorry, the second question in terms of follow-up, uh, for these patients, I do see, do see them at least once in follow-up, uh, about a year later, to make sure nothing has changed. Um, there was a survey study that was sent out about uh, three or four years ago where we looked at uh, sort of what pediatric neurosurgeons around the world would do. And uh, the general response was actually about 50% of people wouldn't see further after that first follow-up, uh, whereas 50% of people, it seems like, would actually see them again at least once. Yep. And I think your comments do a very nice job of reflecting some of the uncertainty because in a modern era, depending on where in the world one lives, in, an, um, in, in many places, a, a, um, a bad headache that's recurrent will get an imaging study. And if the imaging study reveals a cyst, then everybody goes, aha, when now we have a reason. And now they're in your office and it's your job to either do something that fixes it, that fixes it, or have the reserved to say, yeah, we see the same thing you do, but our experience is not that this is very helpful in terms of fixing it. And that can sometimes be a difficult discussion with families because bad headaches are common. They really impair people's lives. So they really want to, you know, get rid of that headache very understandably. So this is a very difficult, um, very, very difficult challenge. Perhaps we should hold further conversation so we don't get too far off schedule because we do try and be a little disciplined with regard to that. Nora, would you like to um, lead us on through the program? 
Uh, thank you so much, sir. Um, I would like to now invite our second speaker, Professor Jeffrey Blount himself. He's mm -hmm. co-chair of the ISPN Education Committee. And uh, obviously we all know him very well. He's very active in all these pediatric research workshop courses, webinars, and have more than 150 publications and several oral citations. Um, he's a member of the pediatric division of the UAB Department of Neurosurgery. His practices can find strictly to pediatrics and he practices at the Children's Hospital of Alabama. He has authored more than 100 papers on various topics in pediatric neurosurgery and obviously presents regularly at national and international conferences. He has been visiting professor at four different institutions and frequently invited to chair or coordinate panel discussions and courses. Today he will be delivering a lecture on disorders of cortical formation that goes occasion disorders, focal cortical dysplasia, size encephaly, hemi, and suffering and seizures. Uh, uh, Sarah has got a special interest in, in seizure surgery and um, research on, he's got a lot of research on um, uh, on this. So again, thank you so much, sir, uh, for sparing your time, especially from your busy schedule from today. Um, the floor is all yours now. Well, thank you for that generous, generous introduction. And we'll continue kind of on the theme of a bit of a What's the expression? A potpourri, a variety pack, if you will, of these different congenital lesions for everybody to consider. Albert just did a really nice job of tackling cysts and their surgical approach. Each one of these little vignettes that we're doing could be the topic for a lecture in and of itself of an hour's duration or even of a, of a, of a workshop. So there are many, many different things. So what my task was today was to talk a little bit about some of the problems that arise from errors or disorders, if you will, of cortical formation. And these are a heterogeneous group of malformations. That is to say, they're different in the way they look, they're different in the way they present, but they're all important to us as neurosurgeons who have interest in the problems of children. They're typically characterized by abnormal structure, and that contributes to their pathology, which is to say they either can be associated with or induce developmental disability and neurocognitive delay or seizures. And I think as surgeons, that's probably where we really get drawn in because that's where we can make a difference. They're caused by an interruption of normal developmental pathways. And so in order to understand them and get a good working uh, concept, uh, you have to understand a little bit of the normal pathways. And that interruption typically comes from either a lack of a gene expression of a normal gene or expression of an abnormal gene or sometimes some external so-called epigenetic influences uh, can cause these developmental processes to go awry. So I stuck in these few slides right here I'm going to come back to this classification. The concept here, as you look at this slide, please don't get caught up in the classification, but instead look at the picture on your right. The picture on your right, if I ask you to raise your hand and say, what do you see? Most people would say something about looking at a person, it looks like a line drawing in black and white of a person perhaps wearing some eyeglasses, looking down and maybe to the right a little bit. And that's very true. But if you change your frame of reference and read the picture from, I don't know if my pointer is showing up or not, but if you read the picture from the top down, from the top left corner down, and let your eye follow the writing, I've made a liar out of you. The letter L-I-A-R is right there. And the point is, I love this little diagram because it shows the liar, the word liar was right there all along while we were looking and seeing somebody wearing eyeglasses, but it required us to change our frame of reference. And this is the point I always make with our students and our residents about these entities, so-called cortical dysplasias and some of the other developmental anomalies that are at the cornerstone of modern pediatric epilepsy surgery, because these are entities that existed for years, but we didn't understand them, we didn't appreciate them, and we certainly didn't understand the potential for these lesions of structural significance to be irritating and be the basis of medically resistant epilepsy that is the substrate we target 
when we do pediatric epilepsy surgery. So I would submit to you in the same way that I tell our, our residents, modern pediatric epilepsy surgery was facilitated by two things, really enabled by two things. One was the conceptual change in, in, in framework and approach to recognize that medically resistant epilepsy largely comes from structural abnormalities in the brain. A third of epilepsy doesn't control with medicines. And uh, <laughs> those by and large come from structural abnormalities in the brain. We, we can't see them all with CT or MR, but we now know they're there. And the second thing was the technologic capacity to find them with a combination of advanced functional imaging, uh, SPECT, PET, MEG, as well as intracranial electrodes and things of this nature. So that really advanced our understanding, those two things. One was the conceptual awareness of these entities, and two was the technologic capability to go find them and hence target them. And those two concepts opened the door for modern pediatric epilepsy surgery and have enabled us to help children that heretofore were completely beyond the bound of anybody that we could reach out to help and provide relief from, 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 from their epilepsy. Okay, back to the specific sort of topic at hand, but I wanted to place it in that context because these developmental anomalies and how they occur are absolutely central to what we want to do as uh, pediatric epilepsy surgeons and not just epilepsy, they impact a lot of er other areas, but probably the area where we as surgeons can do something on these developmental anomalies to fundamentally change the path of the disease is in pediatric epilepsy. So this is a beautiful diagram on the bottom, and I recommend this reference to, to you for those who are interested. It's a lovely paper that reviews the structural abnormalities and problems that can occur. And what this shows is, is that along the normal pathways, there, there, uh, along the normal uh, development of the nervous system, there can be identified very specific uh, periods of activity that are occurring, led off by proliferation, then migration, then a period of synaptogenesis and pruning by apoptosis that leads to the development of the, of the six-layered cortex that we know right now. In the proliferation phase, the neuronal and glial precursors are generated right around the outside of the lateral ventricle. They are then, uh, they then radiate outwards. And the, there were a series of hypotheses on these as to whether or not they sent out a projectile to the ependymal surface and shimmied themselves up, or whether or not they uh, went up radial glia, which was ultimately the route that was shown to be predominant here. So they travel along the radial glia from the subependymal surface of the ventricle radiating out. And it is the, um, the then they make uh, synaptic um, connections by the millions and billions, and many of them are pruned. Those are your three conceptual stages of the cortical organization. And again, outlined beautifully in this diagram here uh, on the right side of the slide. So now we come from the basic concept, which is the proliferation, the migration, and the organization, and recognize that just like any other process in human anatomy or physiology, each of these delicate, elegant steps can be interrupted, can be disrupted. And in so doing, we end up with a problem. So as we look at the three basic stages, those of proliferation, migration, and organization, you'll, you'll let your eye go to that upper corner and you can see the disorders that come from characterization from problems at each step. So in the proliferative phase, when we don't get enough neurons generated, we end up with a lysencephalic smooth brain that I'll show you some pictures of in a moment. When it's excessive, we end up with things like hemimegencephaly. And when it's more sporadic, we end up with some focal cortical dysplasia. So we'll move through these kind of individually. And here's, here's that same information uh, put forward in a way that's a little more visually approachable. Each phase of the fundamental process can be disrupted. And if disrupted, when disrupted, results in unique, specific uh, neurologic problems. <clears throat> this is a beautiful diagram from a very, another very, very nice, that, that same uh, monograph that I was telling you about before, shows beautifully, that beautiful diagram with the, with the associated micrograph showing the migration of the cells and the formation of the layers as the cells make their way out 
the radial glia, and then they proliferate, pardon me, they proliferate, they make their way out the glia, and then they become organized into the typical six-layered cortex. So I say it to families like this to, to give them a way that they can understand. If, if in, in America, we like sandwiches a lot, and a perfect so-called club sandwich, which is a treat in America, has all these different specific layers of whatever it may be, meat or veg or it's tomato or whatever, and that makes for a very delicious thing to eat. The human cortex is the same thing, only the layering gets mixed up. One layer might be too thick, one layer might be missing. Now that's not a growth problem like a neoplasia, it's a dysplasia and that's an irritating phenomenon that is the root of a lot of epilepsy. So what about, so let's march through these kind of sequentially, right? In the proliferation phase, we can have too many, we can have too few. We can have them aberrantly placed. Let's march through it. So lysencephaly is interesting neurosurgically, but not as relevant to us because we don't have many tools in our toolbox that help these children. Smooth agyria, pachygyria, variety of different eponyms, Walker Warburg, Miller Deaker syndrome for these varieties of different lysencephalic patterns that look like these pictures on your left. I draw your attention to the outer cortical surface that looks very smooth, lacking the usual gyri and sulci that we come to know uh, well uh, of, uh, of a normal developmental brain. Now I'm gonna tweak you a little bit because this is one of my colleague's slides that she threw the heterotopias in with this as well. And we're gonna circle back to these, but I want you to notice these little gray chunks, thinking in terms of those cells, those neuronal cells migrating out and say they're getting stuck. These are heterotopias and they are most important to us surgically when they're around the ventricle because the periventricular heterotopias very nicely illustrated here. You see the two little uh, gray chunks, if you will, sitting just inside the lateral ventricle. The, uh, quite epileptogenic, okay? Very attractive target for us surgically. So heterotopias, normal neurons in an abnormal location. They result from the arrest of neuroblast migration. They can occur anywhere. They are highly epileptogenic and they can be treated with a variety of different techniques. We can go in surgically uh, in, in uh, high resource countries. We can put a laser fiber in and burn them. Uh, they're very amenable to treatment and people tend to do quite well. This is back to proliferation. This is the epitome of too much proliferation. Hemimegancephaly on one side of the brain, we have too much development, but it's not normal neuronal development. This is a gigantic hamartomatous um, overgrowth of an entire hemisphere. And these can be spectacular. They can be very large. They can push the brain to the other side. They can contract the ventricle. They are extremely epileptogenic. And almost always these children are, have very high seizure burdens and sometimes status epilepticus. Vocal cortical dysplasias are a heterogeneous group. They're nests of cortical dysplasia that result from um, aberrations of either migration or pruning afterwards, such that we end up with a variation in severity between some that are quite mild and others that are much more pronounced. They have big heterotopic uh, balloon cells in them, gigantic dysmorphic neurons. Some of them are very subtle, like the one up at the top right where the white arrow shows a, an enlarged sulcus, and there is no other clue to it other than that enlarged sulcus. Now, unlike, unlike a glioma, these do not take up any mass effect, right? They are there, they, are, they have higher signal on T2, Almost all the, the abnormality is within gray matter, but most obviously they neither contrast enhance, have edema, nor have mass effect. There is a classification system, the so-called um, initially Taylor uh, classification system has been uh, largely replaced by the ILAE classification system, uh, which is uh, uh, ILAE is International League, and these uh, reflect the um, <laughs> epileptogenic qualities and some of the histologic qualities. Uh, for sake of time, I'm not going to dive into each particular uh, class of subclassification, but it is pertinent to know both that the 
uh, Taylor system existed. The 2B is the type that has balloon cells, which is a common test question. Um, and that these have a characteristic epileptogenic EEG signature in that the dysplasias that are found in a brain that have low voltage, fast activity associated with them are thought to be particularly epileptogenic and hence predictive of good surgical outcome. All right, moving on to other problems. Now, what about if we involve an entire half of a hemisphere? Then we get an anomaly called schizencephaly. And schizencephaly is a large cleft that's thought to involve the developmental process of an entire hemisphere. If it's true schizencephaly, the lining of the cleft, whether it's closed like this one or open like the one on the right, is lined with gray matter, right? It usually results from an injury. It involves the entire thickness of the hemisphere, can come from an infection or ischemia. These can be associated with epilepsy, but the lip itself uh, is not necessarily implicated in epileptogenesis. Again, emphasizing they are called open lip if they, if they communicate with the free subdural space in the ventricle, and they're closed lipped if they don't. You see on the picture on the right, it is closed lipped because there's no communication directly to the ventricle. But if you look critically, where my pointer is, it's all gray matter. So that is a schizencephaly, not a porencephaly. A porencephalic cyst is loss of tissue. A destructive process has occurred, either a stroke, an injury, an infection. Porencephaly is loss of tissue. And uh, schizencephaly is a developmental anomaly that is lined with gray matter. Okay, so gray matter lines schizencephaly, not true with porencephaly. Porencephalic cysts can arise from a variety of different things, but they never have gray matter on them. Polymicrogyria is, a, is a, a developmental anomaly characterized by multiple small convolutions. It usually arises either as, a, <laughs> as an exposure problem, or sometimes it can be seen in a chromosomal anomaly. Some children with uh, uh, neural tube defects in spina bifida will get a parietal polymicrogyria uh, that, uh, that, that's, that's actually fairly common. The most uh, surgically relevant one is the so-called Kuznicki syndrome or the parasylvian uh, polymicrogyria that's often associated with cortical dysplasias. It tends to be bilateral. It tends to be medically resistant. There's uh, there's there's interest in whether or not this can be treated in some of the lit therapies with their laser ablation have, have been discussed about this, but this remains a bit of a frontier. Finally, I'll close with the notion of sulcation because that was an assigned topic. This is relevant for us, but it does not have a direct surgical correlate. Cortical folding is characteristic of many mammalian brains and is preserved largely across species. The degree of folding correlates as a function of both cortical surface area and cortical thickness. Humans, it, this process starts uh, in, in the second trimester, and I have some, re some references in suggested references at the end for uh, interested readers. But you can see here this uh, table from the Barkovich, Barkovich uh, wonderful textbook in pediatric neuroimaging, how the, the timing of the various infolding processes is standardized. And, uh, is, and aberrations are associated with a variety of different factors, um, <clears throat> including some schizophrenic, some neurocognitive, and most of the epilepsy is a generalized epilepsy, not one that can be an attractive surgical target at this point in time. So with that, I'll conclude. I wanna thank you for your attention. Thank you for the uh, opportunity to, to, to serve and work on this. I look forward to your questions. And I recommend these if, for the interested reader that wants to expand um, your knowledge and get some of these nice diagrams into your own files. These four references are, are, are quite uh, useful. Uh, I acknowledge my colleague at uh, UAB, Sarah Navarro, because she and I have done a lecture on this uh, before, and I've used a few of her slides in there. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you very much, Jeff, for this very elegant and informative uh, lecture. Uh, just uh, to compare the cyst previously, we have exuberant uh, image and very small clinic or no clinic correlates. On your speech, we saw the opposite. We have uh, a exuberant clinic in some cases, very difficult to deal uh, epilepsy patients. 
And we need to look for the image because it's not evident if we don't have a very good image or a very good uh, radiologist or the neurosurgeon training to see or to look at for cortical dysplasia or other small things. Thank you very much, Jeff. Fantastic. Uh, up to you, Norm. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for the amazing lecture. Um, uh, ma'am, uh, Professor Nasty, I want you to kindly suggest me further because Dr. Um, Tatiana was next was our next speaker was supposed to be, but uh, I guess that you have got some internet issues. If, is, is it all right if you want to? No, uh, no, we see. can continue with Tatiana. I, I, I think it's okay, it solved the problem. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, I will, I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Tatiana Protsenko. She is a pediatric neurosurgeon from Brazil. She is working at the Instituto Fernandes Figaro in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, she's a very active neurosurgeon with several publications and oral citations. You might have seen her in uh, several of the Brazilian workshops. And uh, recently I myself attended uh, her own uh, oral citation virtually on the internet on a web conference. Uh, she's a very good and very active pediatric neurosurgeon, um, a woman pediatric neurosurgeon as well. Uh, to add on it, being a woman neurosurgeon myself, it's, it's really important for me to mention it. So again, thank you so much, Dr. Tatiana, for joining us today. She will be talking about VP shunts in infants. Dr. Tatiana, the floor is all yours now. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, uh, Nilsi and Jeff for the opportunity to be here and present our experience in Brazil, in Rio, uh, with uh, VP Shanks. So I have uh, no disclosures. And of course, to talk about VP Shanks, we have to talk about a little bit about uh, pathophysiological mechanisms of hydrocephalus. So by definition, hydrocephalus is defined by the International Hydrocephalus Working Group as an active distension of the ventricular system of the, of the brain resulting from inadequate passage of CSF from its point of production within the cerebral ventricles to its point of absorption into the systemic circulation. So unfortunately, it's still a prevalent disease and responsible for almost half of all pediatric neurosurgical procedures. And of course, to talk about um, uh, pathophysiological mechanisms, we, ha we have to remember uh, the main three statements of CSF physiology. First of all, that uh, um, CSF will be produced by the choroid plexus by an active secretion. Second of all, the unidirectional flow from the ventricles to the subarachnoid space. And third of all, the passive absorption of CSF that will be held in the choroid villi. So when we look to this model, it's easy to understand that an imbalance between the production, uh, the flow and the absorption will lead to a net accumulation of CSF inside the ventricles. ventricles. So here, an example of a choroid plexus uh, papilloma uh, resulting in overproduction or a pineal tumor uh, resulting in obstruction or a reduction of absorption due to hemorrhage or infection. And Dundee and co-workers uh, based this uh, classification on this model. So uh, they classify hydrocephalus in communicating and non-communicating ones, depending on the CSF free flow between the ventricles and the lumbar subarachnoid space. And now though we use this classification to decide whether is better an ETV or whether is better uh, a VP shunt, uh, uh, we know that uh, actually all kinds of hydrocephalus have an obstructive point. And by this work from Rickate and co-workers, only the choroid plexus papilloma will be the true communicating one. But also if before we thought that uh, the choroid plexus was the only one uh, responsible for the production of CSF, today we know that CSF uh, appear and disappears uh, inside the brain uh, due to differences in osmotic and hydrostatic forces between the capillaries, the interstitial fluid volume, and the CSF volume. 
And also nowadays we know more of this pathophysiological mechanism. We know that hydrocephalic patients will have the position of GFAP, gliosis, that will lead to a more rigid brain. Uh, and this can explain why children uh, can have a, a shunt dysfunction without ventricular dilatation. And now we know also uh, the role of aquaporin channels one and four in production and transportation of CSF. And more, most recently, uh, the role of the lymphatic system in uh, absorption of CSF in a huge amount around uh, the olfactory nerve. So when we look at this, we understand that hydrocephalus is complex in its genesis, in its etiology, and so choosing the best treatment is a challenge. But when we talk about infants, we have three more problems, uh, which are, uh, first of all, the rapid brain, brain growth uh, that will develop brain during this distortion by the ventricular distension caused by hydrocephalus. So the second problem is that uh, children, infants have a potential for multiple sites of obstruction. We know that small children will have an immature uh, choroid villi. So uh, because of that, we know that the success rate of ETV in small babies uh, is low. And also we have the distensible nature of the school without a fixed intracranial volume. And because of that, uh, the most important sign of these children is uh, the large head size. So the macrocrania is a re reality uh, with bulging fontanelles. Children can present with this downward deviation of the eyes, which is called the perineal sign. Also vomiting, sleepiness, irritability and seizure can be present. And in the diagnosis, we can perform a prenatal ultrasound or even a fetal MRI that here we present a myelomeningo cell with ventricular megaly, but of course in a newborn with an open fontanelle, ultra transfontanellar ultrasound will give a lot of information. The ventricular index, uh, the resistance index by Doppler, but also CT scan can help us when we talk about infection. So here a small abscess and also with CT scan, we can perform a ventriculography to see if there is a multilocalated hydrocephalus or not, but of course, MRI is better for that and avoid uh, radiation, but sometimes uh, is not uh, available. So when we decide by the etiology and by the age of the children and uh, uh, the need of a VP shunt, we need to understand uh, what is a shunt, what is uh, its composition and how does it work. So the shunt has three elements. Uh, the ventricular catheter, the valve itself, and a distal catheter. In the market, we have a lot of different valves, uh, different uh, uh, in size and mechanisms. But the most important when we talk about infants is to choose a low profile valve to av avoid uh, skin lesions. So this is only an example of one kind of brand in the market Though, so we have the valve that has this reservoir. This reservoir can be functioned uh, to uh, take CSF samples as much as we need. CSF so will pass uh, through this reservoir and will get inside the valve itself. So when ICP is higher than the resistance of the valve, the valve will open, this uh, membrane will go down and CSF uh, will pass. But when ICP is uh, lower than the resistance of the valve, this membrane will go up and of course uh, CSF will not pass. So the thinner the membrane, the lower the resistance, the thicker the membrane, the higher the resistance. And so in this way, we will have these different uh, range of pressure that are choose uh, by the midpoint of this range, 
will be the normal flow rate between 20 and 25 milliliters per hour. So what does it mean? If we choose a medium pressure valve, we, it, mean, it means that in 25 milliliters per hour, the pressure will be 95. So when ICP is higher than 95, the valve will open. And when ICP um, is lower than 95, uh, the valve will close. So this is the first generation chance, the first one in the market. This a simple mechanism. And when we decide to put the shunt, it's important to perform a protocol uh, to avoid infection. We know that it's a device that infection rates are the real problem. So uh, the protocol will be based in hair wash and in, in bath in the day after, in the morning of the surgery. Usually we perform uh, the first surgery of the day. We use prophylactic antibiotics. In the position in the OR, the head must be away from the door. And in this no touch protocol, after uh, cleaning the skin, we can put uh, the sterile drape or the IOV to isolate the skin and not to touch uh, the skin during the, the insertion of the shunt. After passing the introductor of the catheter, we have to change gloves or use double gloving. And uh, also we change instruments uh, that we are going to manipulate this valve and touching these elements when only is really needed. And after connecting all the valve, we will see uh, the, uh, the, the flow of the CSF in the distal catheter, which is in the most of the time uh, insert in the peritoneal cavity. So we know that shunts uh, change a lot uh, the survival curve of children with uh, hydrocephalus. But in the same way, uh, it brings uh, morbidity to these children. First of all, we know that 40% of patients will present some kind of mechanical problems with the shunt in the first two years after insertion. Other problems will be the slit ventricle syndrome, which, which is represented by these small ventricles and a low pressure headaches. Also, and this will be caused by over drainage, also over drainage can present with a subdural egroma or hematoma and infection that can be present uh, from four to 9% uh, in the, uh, the cases in the literature and the problems of infection, not only the shunt revision, but also this problem of multilocalated hydrocephalus. So when we talk about over drainage, why does it happen? Because when the patient with a valve, he uh, is in the standing position, we will not have the anti-siphon effect that is uh, normal, which is performed by the jugular vein. So we bypass this natural uh, defense and uh, the children will overdrain it. So the second generation shunt was created because of this. And this is an example of an anti-siphon uh, device, but there is a lot of uh, types in the literature, but we can see that this one is made by membranes. And when uh, children are in the stand position, these membranes will collapse and this will uh, give more resistance to the valve and this will uh, add um, 15 millimeters in pressure in each uh, range of pressures. Of course, this was not, uh, this is, doesn't, didn't solve all the problems of over drainage. And because of this, nowadays we have uh, the adjustment tools, the program, external programmable valves. There are the third and fourth generations valves. The problem of infection. So everybody have uh, cases like these with multiple uh, shunts in the same patients. First of all, when we have an, an infection, it's important to know that it exists the antibiotic um, impregnated shunt catheters that can actually uh, uh, give us more security uh, in shunt dysfunction due to repeated infection. So in this paper, we can see uh, patients with EVD without this catheter, 13% of infection with anti 
create antibiotic uh, impregnated valves, the zero percent. Of course, they are more expensive, but in long term uh, is better for the hospital uh, because we have lower incidence of uh, shunt revision and lower time of uh, hospitalization. And also when we have infection, we have to study if we are facing multilocalated hydrocephalus. So this is one case uh, that we perform a ventriculogram and we can see that left side doesn't communicate with right side and doesn't communicate with the posterior fossa. So uh, efforts must be done uh, with endoscopy to uh, perform a only shunt with an only catheter because more catheters this uh, uh, infant will have more risk of shunt dysfunction. So here in the video, you can see that we perform um, a septostomy that communicates uh, the right ventricle and the left ventricle after we are going to get inside the third ventricle by the foramen of Monroe. So here we are inside the third ventricle, we can see the aqueduct and we will pass the Fogarty balloon to be sure that there is no membrane and the catheter, we have multiple holes that will communicate the posterior fossa and the supratentorial ventricles will be placed uh, guided by endoscopy. And these will help us to leave only one shunt uh, in this uh, child. When the peritoneum fails, this is uh, another problem. So we can use, in these cases, uh, video laparoscopy to be able to release the, uh, the adhesions of the peritoneum and trying to put the valve in place. If it's not possible, of course, atrial shunts may be needed, but we have also these possibilities to use the superior sagittal sinus and the gallbladder. So uh, now we know etiology difficult uh, in infants and types of, uh, of uh, shunts. What is the best shunt? So of course, I'm not here to say uh, what is the best shunt, but what is important is to understand all the physiopathological mechanisms of hydrocephalus for each children to decide, to be able to decide the best treatment. In uh, overall manner, uh, for small babies with this macrocrania, this huge macrocrania with a, a, a thin uh, skin, we can use fixed differential pressure valve. When children are a little older, we can use with an anti-siphon uh, device. And for example, for tumors, after the tumor resection, we can use an adjustable prog external programmable valve. So uh, to take home message, of course, the optimal shunt design and technology should be based in all of these criteria. So it includes patient age, etiology of hydrocephalus, the comorbidities, history of previous shunts, malfunctions and infections, and of course, surgeon personal experience and local hospital financial constraints. And understanding the shunt valve technology can be very essential for the best clinical outcome uh, possible to avoid complication, prior to implanting or revising shunt in patients with uh, hydrocephalus. Thank you. Thanks, Tatiana, for this uh, excellent overview about shunt. And uh, sure, there is a lot of uh, controversial issue, but we know that uh, the first shunt is the best option to try to avoid shunt revision. But uh, we will discuss at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. Please, Nor. And we now proceed to our next speaker, Dr. Luca Massimi, who is the Assistant Professor of Pediatric Neurosurgery at the AJMLI Hospital, Italy. He has organized and served as an important member of faculty in several international courses and congresses in neurosurgery. He has presented more than 100 abstracts and is a part of editorial boards 
of many um, journals and um, you might have seen several of his very important publications might have read him and um, I think that um, he has been um, I've also seen his several papers read myself so it's a matter of huge pleasure and honor to have him today uh, at the course uh, he will be talking about EBD the indications of the EBD the technique and the outcomes of EBD Dr. Luca the floor is all yours now Thank you, thank you so much. I really thanks uh, uh, Nancy and Jeff, uh, all the organizers who are working on this project. I'm very happy to attend this meeting and to talk about the external ventricular drainage. Uh, I hope that the screen is okay and that you can hear me. I have no discourses on this topic. And what about the indication of uh, external ventricular drainage? We have a, really a wide spectrum of indication that ranges, for example, from the uh, management of CSF collection. Look at this case, for example, a complication of Chiari surgery with uh, mm, suboccipital pseudomeningocele. Another indication is the management of the subarachnoid hemorrhage. This is not a so common, uh, at least after rupture of aneurysm, it's a common topic in pediatric neurosurgery. Actually, the, ca the case I'm showing is uh, an old man but uh, the external ventricular drainage is useful in reducing and monitoring the intracranial pressure, in stabilizing the patient before the embolization of surgery, and also to prevent or treat hydrocephalus as it happened in this case. Another uh, main indication for EVD is the ICP monitoring and reduction of the ICP during the severe head injury. This is the case of a motorbike accident in a 16-year-old boy where we put an external drainage to monitor the ICP, which was high, and to draw the CSF, but it was not enough uh, to uh, treat the rest ICP. And of course, we went ahead with uh, the compressive cranium. Uh, of course, when you are not expected to draw CSF, uh, I advise not to use an external drainage, uh, burden a certain risk of infection, but we have alternative ICP uh, monitoring system for the multi-parametric monitoring of these patients. Uh, another indication in severe injury is uh, the transient reduction of the brain swelling in preparation of the, um, the cranioplasty. This is a case of a 16-year-old girl, which was decompressed after the injury, uh, just before the replacement of the um, bone flap we were able to reduce this swelling with external drainage that then was removed. What about the hemoventricle? Uh, of course, the external drainage can be used to monitor the ICP, also to cover the CSF washing, as it happened in this case. But usually in children, at least in my institution, we are more prone to perform a neuroendoscopic lavage on brain wash, if you prefer followed or not by a gallel shank. This is the ultrasound of a three-week-old pretend baby before and after the uh, brain wash. We left also a gallel shank, but not with, in this case of an external ventricular drainage. Yeah, another uh, really a little bit debate use of the external ventricular drainage is uh, in the management of posterior fossa uh, hydrocephalus. I mean, uh, what is what we did, we do in our institution, we perform a perioperative um, external ventricular drainage at the same time of the tumor removal, because we know that most of the cases, the hydrocephalus uh, do not appear in the, do not remain, do not persist, does not persist, sorry, in the postoperative period that's it happened in this case and the uh, external ventricular drainage is helpful in, uh, for the ICP monitoring during the stay in the intensive care unit. And finally, a main indication of the external ventricular drainage is for sure the transient management of the post-infectious hydrocephalus. That is when you cannot put directly a shunt because of an infection. Look at this case, for example, a premature baby with a severe perinatal infection of Klebsiella pneumonia where we treat the baby with the endoscopic lavage for removing disinfected clothes and with an external ventricular drainage for monitoring also the healing of the CSF infection, other than for treating the hydrocephalus that then was finally managed with endoscopic uh, removal of the septa and with a shunt. What about the technique? We, uh, I'm used to say that uh, there are 
many pitfalls in the uh, execution of the external ventricular drainage because it's uh, simple but not easy. So it's important to start with a um, proper positioning. The positioning is fine if you perform a frontal external ventricular drainage with the head fixed and tilted 30 degrees from the floor. We can shave or not shave. In our institution, we prefer not to shave unless the child is uh, not cooperating, especially with the very small children. And uh, the entry site is usually the cocker point that is two centimeters in front of the coronal suture and three centimeters far for the midline. Of course, once again, I advise to tailor the uh, bar hole according to the characteristic of the patients and the characteristic of the hydrocephalus. This is what I used to do because I often um, use uh, this type of approach also for the endoscopic ventriculosome. This is the standard for my type of uh, um, trajectory. The skinning season may be done with a curvilinear skinning season. I use it when the child is expected to receive a shunt or otherwise with a linear skinning season that I prefer for a simple external ventriculostomy. Perforating in drill may be used for children or adolescents, uh, otherwise it's a nice key drill or even a bistouri in neonates is uh, uh, enough. We don't need uh, such a big hole to perform an external ventricular uh, drainage. What is important is to prevent the risk of dislocation of the shunt of infection and of the CSF leakage by placing the barrel in the middle of your field if you are using a curvilinear flap or a little bit eccentric, as you can see here, if you use a linear incision, because uh, the skin then can properly cover the bar hole. Uh, then, of course, the dura matter is open. Uh, we usually do a cruciform uh, way to open the dura, starting from the midpoint. Why? Because you can have some vessel, cortical vessel below. below. You can easily control the bleeding from a cortical vessel if you can uh, look at the cortical vessel. If you start from the uh, beginning of the barrel, then you uh, run the risk to have to follow the vessel uh, bleeding below the bone and you have to enlarge your uh, barrel. Uh, the cortex uh, should be coagulated gently but carefully in order to avoid this kind of complication. What about the trajectory? We have two main landmarks. Of course, this is uh, the, standard the standard external ventricular draining, a free end technique. So our uh, markers are the tragus on the sagittal plane and the gabella or the uh, internal cantus in the coronal plane. What is important is to plan in advance your trajectory, especially if you are performing the technique in the free end and not to change when you are placing the catheter because uh, you have a very short tolerance uh, comparing the uh, angle that you have at the surface of the brain and the angle that you will reach at the end of your uh, procedure that may um, lead you to miss the ventricle. The cannulation of the ventricle may be done with a um, cushion needle especially if there are two operators, one can cannulate the ventricle, the other one can place the uh, catheter. Otherwise, you can uh, cannulate directly the ventricle with the um, catheter and then remove the style. Ideally, all the holes of the catheter should be inside the ventricle. But once again, you have to check your catheter, especially looking if you have appropriate markers on these catheters and to plan in advance the length of the catheter. Otherwise, once again, the complication may be this one. What about the type of catheter? As you can see, in my institution, we are used to use the antibiotic impregnated catheters for normal hydrocephalus, for hydrocephalus associated to tumors or to uh, brain uh, injury. But of course, if this catheter is not available, you can use uh, without problem the standard catheters. What is important, in my opinion, uh, if you look, use a standard catheter or an impregnated catheter, is to perform an adequate tonalization of the uh, catheter, especially in small babies, uh, at least three, four, five centimeters from the surgical wound, and to proper uh, fix the catheter to the, uh, to the skin. This is important. This is the system we use in our institution. It is called SecuraCut. 
it can be used also for other purposes, such as the multimodal parameter, also for the Venus lines, it has different diameters, and it ensures the proper fix of the fixation of the catheter. Try to avoid this, as you can see, very short tunnel under the skin and improper uh, fixation of the catheter that uh, make it prone to the uh, dislodgement. We can have some variation, of course, to the uh, in, in external ventricular drainage, for example, by placing in the occipital region. This is very rare, unless you are planning to perform an occipital uh, ventricular peritoneal shunt. For example, we use this kind of approach in some really emergent case of posterior fossa tumor, where we don't have the time to perform prior a uh, frontal ventriculostomy and then the, uh, the compression of the posterior fossa. This is another variation that is the uh, procedure, the percutaneous procedure at bedside. Uh, we use a, um, an aesthetic uh, um, cream, uh, local anesthesia, disinfection, the endoscopic guidance. We need just two advocates, one to cannulate the ventricle, the other one for the tunnelization, then we can use a simple uh, lumbar drainage to be placed inside the ventricle. Of course, this is just for babies who cannot uh, face, for example, a subgallial shunt or endoscopic um, lavage. And finally, the navigation. This, this is not routinely uh, used, but uh, it should be encouraged, in my opinion. Uh, of course, it can be used in an in injury or in pseudotumor cerebri or whenever you are difficult ventricles or abnormal anatomies but it should be used also to avoid the malposition of the catheter, which is quite frequent, as we are going to see in the um, free end, with the free end technique. Please remember that we, uh, if you are doing, dealing with small children or infants, uh, you can use uh, ultrasounds as a reliable guide. And finally, the outcome. The outcome is very difficult to assess with external ventricular drainage because uh, although this is one of the most common procedures performed in neurosurgery, there are no studies really assessing an outcome. But of course, we can uh, have some considerations. The first one is, for example, the management of the uh, um, hydrocephalus in posterior fossa tumor, as mentioned before. As mentioned in my institution, we prefer to use the external ventricular drainage perioperatively just to avoid an unnecessary endoscopic ventriculostomy. Uh, that happens in uh, 70 to 90 percent of the cases to avoid the upward cerebellar recognition, but especially since we operate in prone position to avoid the uh, closure of a preoperative ETD. But of course, it is a good solution in other centers, especially if they operate in a sitting position to um, improve the quality of the uh, operation and to control the intracranial pressure prior to the um, tumor removal. Uh, an outcome, an important outcome of the external ventricular drainage to be focused on is the rate of infection. Uh, we don't have a, a real mean rate, but as you can see in the papers, it ranges from 1 to 20 percent. Uh, 80 percent is the mean rate after 10 days of external drainage, 12 percent in pretending. So the antibiotic impregnated catheters may be a solution, as you can see here, to reduce this kind of complication in preterm babies or in general in a, a different series. But uh, here I added the question mark because if you look uh, at uh, um, prospective randomized clinical trials, there was no differences between antibiotic, antibiotic impregnated catheters and um, shunt uh, and standard uh, external drainage and standard shunt. So in this case, we have to contextualize. Uh, in my institution, we had a significant improvement, a significant reduction of infection, so we use this kind of Catheters, maybe this is not needed in other centers. Another important outcome is the uh, prevention of the postoperative dislocation of the shunt. Uh, as you can see, the incidence is 5%, but maybe it is underreported. And it is important to prevent this complication because the pull out of the external ventricular drainage raises up to 30% the risk of infection. And this is a surgeon dependent complication that can be avoided or better, it, that must be avoided. 
So we can use the, the system I showed you, but in the literature, you can find the other system that are effective as well. And as you can see in our experience, among 205 patients that we studied and where we used this locking, uh, catheter locking device, there were no dislodgements. And another complication that must be prevented, and that is once again surgery dependent, is the uh, wrong positioning of the catheter. Uh, it burdens around 40%, 15% of the cases in the free end technique, but it is reported up to 60% in some cities. So you are much younger than me, you were born in the navigation area, you can choose whatever you want among the uh, navigation techniques. We have the navigation percutaneous technique that has been uh, tested, it seems to be uh, really effective. We have the robotic arm, if you uh, look at very recent literature also tested in uh, phantom models or in cadaveric studies, also the augmented reality or the smart on, on navigation is effective to perform uh, external ventricular drainage or even biopsy. So use whatever you want, but try to reduce this kind of complication. So Nancy was encouraging the uh, movies. I have a short movie uh, that I show you. And this is the technique we use for the external ventricular drainage. It's that just a couple of minutes. And then I conclude, this was a case where we use a linear skin incision. And uh, this operation um, show you the um, free end technique that has been realized by two of my residents. Take your time to clean, of course, the uh, surgical field. You can use perforators for uh, um, children or adolescents as so before, take your time to remove the endosteum and to expose properly the dura. And then of course the dura is uh, uh, coagulated and incised and open. I will show you the cruciform way starting from the midpoint that may be helpful just to control the bleeding should you have the bleeding. Here we start from the middle of the small surgical field. You don't need to perform such a big opening also of the dura, but just to expose properly the cortical surface and then to coagulate the cortical surface. As you can see here, uh, this fashion designer said it would be simple but not easy. I believe that this applies perfectly to the external ventricular drainage. This is the um, cortical incision. This is a real-time cannulation of the ventricles. Uh, the tragus and the uh, gabella are the landmarks as showed you before. You can stop as soon as you uh, feel the resistance of the ependima. And then uh, possibly if you are two operators, one maintain the catheter, the other, ones re the other one remove the stylet just to avoid the dislocation of the catheter immediately after the uh, puncture of the ventricle. You can check, of course, for the uh, CSF escape, then maintain the catheter fixed during the tunnelization under the skin. In this case, we use the uh, stylet that is uh, provided for the, uh, in the kit of the catheter the tunnelization not so close to the surgical wound, once again, to prevent the dislocation, infection, and CSF leakage. You can connect the catheter as soon as you mm, made the tunnelization. And then, in my opinion, the most important part of the operation after the cannulation of the ventricle is to properly secure, to properly fix the uh, catheter to the skin and it takes just a few seconds. And uh, uh, it's important to uh, check once you fix the catheter to the skin that the procedure is okay. The operator is checking that there is no dislocation of the catheter. I usually advise to check that at the end of the procedure the CSF is usually going outside we usually close with resorbable stitch. And at the end of the operation, we usually check that everything is okay. So thank you for your attention. Very nice talk, very, very nice, Luca. And for the students, I think you're getting a sense for 
uh, variation in uh, practice. Um, I think it's exceptionally important that from the outset, the students realize the central importance of placing an EBD. You will probably, if you do a career in pediatric or, or do a career in neurosurgery, whether it's with children or not, you will probably save more lives placing an EBD than any other single intervention that you do. It's simple, it's straightforward. Um, Luca has given us nice tips to show how it can be done safely and effectively. Um, and, and I think that can't be overemphasized enough is, is that we almost say to our residents, if things aren't looking good, if somebody's not looking good, you're not sure what to do, place an EVD. We get more people out of trouble because remember in neurosurgery, you often get two for one, right? You get the original problem and you get the hydrocephalus along with it, right? And that's particularly true in pediatrics. There are many, many times where I'm not sure what's going on with somebody's shunt and I'll put an EVD in. I might even leave the distal valve in place put an EVD in it, it's the so-called perfect shunt because you can see it drip moment to moment. You know what the pressure is. You can measure the pressure, right? You measure the pressure and you see, does the child still have headaches or did the headaches all go away? If the headaches go away with the EVD, then guess what friends, your problem is with the shunt. If the headaches are still present and the EVD shows good drainage and low pressure, then you've got to look for other sources. Do you have a sinus thrombosis? Do you have a low grade infection? Do you have something else? Do you have some a neuro neurology diagnosis like migraines or something like that? Those can be very, very challenging. Luca, very great talk, uh, very practical. And I think that should be at the, just the ground zero of students um, and, and people coming up uh, in, in neurosurgery. Uh, re really, really well done. Thank you. I would also make one other point the, the astute students heard two different points of view. You heard two different answers as to the importance of variability in hardware. Luca shared with us the Ben Wharf paper that looked at Chabra shunts and compared them to conventional uh, shunts and found no difference, right? Yes. Right? And no, yet we heard earlier that valves make a difference. Well, why can that be? How can we find papers that have different answers? Why is it that we, the, why does the literature in hydrocephalus uh, show us many things? I'll throw that open for, for folks to comment. Luca, do you want to make any comments on that? Then I'll circle back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, so the paper I showed you were comparing the um, antibiotic impregnated shunt and the Chabra shunt. But Ben Worf uh, did also other studies comparing the Chabra with the standard valve. It didn't find differences. Uh, this is a prospective randomized trial, so it's a high value paper. But as you mentioned, we have different answers coming from different studies. Maybe, as I mentioned before, we are in different contexts. Uh, ben Worf applied these studies in Uganda, even though he replied these studies also in the United States at least with a less, uh, uh, less numerous uh, series. And uh, I believe that also the time when the, the, the study is done uh, is important. So the context, the physical uh, place where we are working, the uh, patients you are treating that are different may provide a different answers, actually. Uh, of course, my suggestion, as mentioned before, is uh, try to um, compare this data with your own experience, and then you choose, because this system are okay, of course. All these systems are okay. And I think that's a very good point. Tatiana, do you have any, any points you want to speak to on, on those issues, like why we see differences in outcomes with regard to choice of shunt material and things like that, because there are papers in all different places on this, and it could be confusing for the students. Yes, um, well, we, we, we know uh, from these papers that we didn't know uh, if one valve is better than the other one when we compare the whole group. But that's why patients must be seen individually. So for example, I had a patient with a posterior fossa tumor and he had a slit ventricle with overdrainage. 
and he uh, was in chemotherapy. He uh, uh, had a, a plaquetopenia and he made a huge subdural hematoma. So I am sure that if I had a fixed pressure valve, that this uh, child would be uh, in the OR to solve this problem. So, but he had the uh, program programmable valve, so we could uh, give a conservative treatment without surgery in that is important in patients with neutropenia, plaquetopenia. So uh, it's, it is individual based in small babies. For example, we have a choroid plexus papilloma and we take out the tumor and this uh, child needs the valve uh, in the end. Why is that? Because we have more pathophysiological mechanisms yes. that uh, will uh, show us that sometimes we cannot uh, just divide in, this is a communicating type, this is a non-communicating type. It's impossible. So it's individually based. Yeah, and I think that's a very good comment. The individually based comment I think reflects the importance of one's training and one's experience. And that's why training and experience and attending courses like this are very important. I also would invite the attention of the, of the learners to a concept in study design that has to do with the number of variables that we're looking at, whether we're talking about hydrocephalus or something else. That's one of the great challenges for studies in hydrocephalus is that there are so many variables present that impact the outcome. The children are different. The hydrocephalus is different. The practitioners are different. The assessments are different. So all of these things lend variability to it. And so each of us are busy and we do a lot of work, but by statistical means, dozens or even sometimes hundreds of patients when we put them together, don't have as much power as when we get to other studies with other conditions where there are lots and lots and lots of patients. So it's very common, whether you're studying hydrocephalus or something else, when there are lots of variables that can change outcome and the numbers are somewhat limited for the results to be a little bit variable. I hope that's helpful because I know that students Residents, others have come to me and said, how is it possible we have so much, um, how is it possible we have so much, um, we have so much variability? So Nelsie's called my attention to something. We're, we're, we're diving into discussion. We haven't finished the presentations. So Nelsie's doing what she does is hold me back, which is a good thing, Nelsie. So thank you. So Nora, would you like to introduce, do we have another speaker? Uh, exactly. Uh, uh, sir, uh, we've got only Professor Nelsie um, herself right now as speaker. We are really pleased to have her as a Perfect. speaker. I know, she, yeah, she gives amazing lectures, and it's, she's a true inspiration. So I am, I'm going to invite her to deliver this lecture. Uh, Professor Nelsie Denon doesn't need any introduction, but for the sake of our formal uh, introduction, I'm just trying to tell you that she's the chair of for the ISPN uh, Education Committee. She's the ex chair of the Pediatric Research Committee of W of the WFNS, and um, obviously she's professor at the head of the Department of Neurosurgery at Sanape Pediatric Neurosurgical Center. Sao Paulo, Brazil. She has been part of numerous conferences, courses, and workshops, and has written many papers, as well as a wonderful book and several book chapters as well. Indeed, she's an inspiration for women neurosurgeons, including me, and um, it's a pleasure to uh, welcome her. She's the organizer, organizer of this course as well, so uh, it, it's, it's a matter of real pleasure to, in, to ask her to deliver this amazing lecture on ETV, uh, Indications and Limitations, ETV and oscopy third ventricle ostomy. So again, thank you so much, Madam. The floor is all yours now. Thank you very much. Your kind words, like usually, dear uh, Nor Maria. Um, we already talked about uh, endoscopic third ventricle ostomy mm -hmm. on this morning. Uh, just some words. 
uh, neuroendoscopy, uh, we have a lot of possibilities to do uh, with uh, video, not only uh, endoscopic third ventriculostomy, but septostomy, uh, acidutoplasty, like uh, uh, Dr. Pratzenko showed us, but we can do biopsy, uh, uh, endoscopic ventricular cisternostomy, cyst, like we saw in this morning, and also uh, coagulation on the choroidal plexus and also release uh, the catheter inside the ventricle and also ventricular lavage in the uh, ventricular hemorrhage or infection when AVD is not enough. And uh, the V patient and uh, endoscopic can uh, do together in the same patient and uh, besides the endoscopic third ventriculostomy, we can do other uh, surgical uh, procedure in the same patient. Uh, we already discussed in this morning uh, only uh, obstructive hydrocephalus in some cases uh, communicant hydrocephalus if the anatomy is uh, perfect, like we saw here on this sagittal T2. If we have the third ventricle uh, in a concave uh, form, probably it's uh, good enough uh, to perform ATV and be successful. But we was discussing about individualized treatment. Just an example, uh, the pediatric neurosurgical view, probably every single pediatric neurosurgeon will indicate endoscopic third ventriculostomy for these patients, seven months old, ventriculomegaly, and macrocephaly. We saw his in the head circumference. But when we indicate surgery here, just the macrocephaly are stable and the family is a doctor's family and they have knowledge. And the question is how we can be sure that the surgery is best than no surgery. And uh, they are discussing yet. If we use the ATV success score from Kulkarni, there is an excellent option to discuss with parents. On this particular case, if we saw age etiology in previous shunt, we have 70% of the probability to be successful to treat hydrocephalus, but the child still absolutely well, and the family have the right to wait and decide by themselves. And uh, on this, another example we saw before, uh, this case with a huge cyst in the posterior fossa with only endoscopic third ventriculostomy, we have more than 10 years now with a controlled situation. Uh, just to see if the third ventriculostomy run, we saw uh, the uh, mammillary bodies just to see different instruments in the same patients. The Fogarty without uh, Mandrill, it wasn't enough. It wa uh, wasn't another one. Uh, and we decided to go with forceps to try to open the tuber scenarium. It wasn't enough. In the same patients, we uh, move with uh, the monopolar without uh, coagulation, without any. Uh, any electricity linked to, to the instrument just to open. And now we are back with the Fogarty uh, just to open better the membrane. Uh, sometimes we plan a one a strategy and we need to be ready to change and to move. This uh, video just to show uh, for the uh, medical students a video before we use before the course on the hands-on with the simulator. When the baby is small, we try to avoid to left the dura mater open. We try to open the dura mater and uh, move a little bit the bone in front. And after we go in, when we are back, we just close the dura to avoid CSF uh, leakage. And we are seeing in the simulator, the video, what we uh, saw in the uh, ATV on the patient. And in some cases, the choroidal plexus coagulation is an option too. 
And the anatomy is very important to, to be aware where we are and try to avoid complications. Uh, some tips for uh, the ATV, warm ringer usually, the floor perforation and dilatation. The Fogarty balloon is more safe than other instruments. Open tuber scenario and liquid membrane and uh, avoid uh, vessels. Uh, be aware and try to avoid uh, cranial nerve injury too. And uh, this patient, it was a VA shunt. It was VP shunt at the beginning, v VA shunt after. And when uh, the VA shunt uh, doesn't work anymore, he came to uh, the operating room and he was free of shunt after uh, the endoscopic third ventriculostomy. And just one word about image after endoscopic third ventriculostomy. We saw a lot of change image after VP shunt. When we perform endoscopic third ventriculostomy, we accept the ventricle a little bit larger than uh, when we perform uh, uh, VP shunt. And here is an instrument that guides us to arrive inside the ventricle. Uh, we call peel away. Uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, it is not available for all kinds of uh, endoscope. But the advantage, we can go in and out without damage. And another utility when we are doing uh, endoscopic third ventriculostomy after VP shunt failure, we can just uh, release the uh, choroidal plexus from the, the catheter. And with this image, we can understand why in some cases, when we do shunt revision, we have bleeding inside the ventricle. Even when we put uh, the wire inside the catheter and we try to coagulate inside, time to time is not enough. This way we can release the catheter with uh, the video and uh, looking what we are doing until the end. And when uh, the catheter is free enough, after the uh, endoscopy procedure, we can just release the catheter and without risk uh, for uh, a bleeding. Uh, we can, it's 100% sure, no, we have early and late failure. Uh, usually when we have uh, early failure, we doesn't uh, redo endoscopic uh, third ventriculostomy. We try, to, try uh, to find another solution. When we have late uh, closure of the stoma, we try uh, to perform uh, a second uh, look or redo endoscopic third ventriculostomy. And when we have a leakage on the, the scar in the first two or three years, we can perform lumbar puncture for uh, one or two days to see if it's enough uh, to keep uh, the, the stoma open. The limitation is after uh, infection or ventriculitis or after ventricular hemorrhage, we have less possibility to be 100% results. And brain malformation, prematurity, or postnatal uh, repair, myelomeningocele in young babies, we have some limitations. And we need to be aware every neurosurgical procedure have complications is exceptional, but uh, there is acceptable mortality over 3%. And this mortality probably doesn't have uh, happen with a VP shunt. Training in neurosurgical uh, endoscopic procedure is necessary. And uh, there is uh, a small uh, adapter for uh, mobile phone, try to decrease this uh, cost for training and for surgical uh, procedure also. In summary, uh, endoscopic third ventriculostomy is not the only option to treat uh, hydrocephalus can uh, be combined with a VP shunt in the same patients. The neurosurgeons need to be training on neuroendoscopy and uh, think that we can do other uh, neurosurgical procedure combined with endoscopic third ventriculostomy. And happy who teach what he knows and learn what he teach 
is from Cora Coralina. He wrote his first book at 76 uh, years old. And gratitude for all my mentors and thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you very much, ma'am. It was an elaborate, for the elaborate and wonderful lecture. I think everyone must have liked it. And for all the wonderful points that were that I do think are very helpful for all the medical students as well as the junior trainees who have just started training and have started to uh, take to, uh, such uh, patients in their practice. So thank you so much, ma'am. Nelsie, that was great. Are, do, you, do we have another presentation. I don't see Sundiff on the call. We can move. There are some thoughtful questions in the Q&A that we could move to in the absence of um, uh, Sundiff Chatterjee. Uh, Sundiff sent a lecture. is recorded with oh, yes, that's right. yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember Linda. We may decide if we, uh, because all the students are with us, we will have this course recorded. Yes. And they will have access, free access afterwards. We may decide together, we have 15 minutes. We can use for uh, this lecture from Sandeep, or we can do the same that we did in module and one with uh, Martina lecture. We can uh, just go with the questions and Linda kindly can add to this uh, module two, the Sandeep lecture. What do you believe? I like the idea of going with the questions because there's some very thoughtful ones and they reflect the dynamic quality of uh, interaction with the, with the audience. Well, how does that sound? Perfect. We can run the questions and uh, even for the speakers that yep. would like to listen to Sandeep uh, conference that usually is fantastic. Very we will good. have on recording, we can see afterwards. So there's a question near the end. Why don't we start with this? Could you share? Share your experience about when to perform ETV versus a shunt for a posterior fossa tumor. If you have a posterior fossa tumor with new onset hydrocephalus, please comment about an ETV versus a shunt. Uh, you, thanks for the question. Uh, on posterior fossa tumor, we try to uh, go in the the posterior tumor first with an AVD, an external ventricular drainage for three to five days. After this, if it's necessary to have a hydrocephalus treatment after the, the tumor out, we perform another uh, MRI and we decide case by case, if we have a good anatomy, we perform ATV. If it's not a good anatomy, we just straight uh, to VP shunt. If you shunt, yes, I, I see. I have a question to Luca, please. Uh, did you change your AVD with uh, regular time? If you need, for example, three, four weeks uh, AVD, did you change uh, after 10, 20, uh, 13 days? Yes, it's a good question. Of course, we try not to maintain for so, such a long period the external drainage, but sometimes we are forced to do it. So if we are managing an, an infectious hydrocephalus, we change regularly the external ventricular drainage, especially if we have still the um, evidence of the CSF infection, or at least just to be sure that the the bacteria is not attached to the uh, external ventricular drainage. Otherwise, it's difficult that we maintain for such a long period an external ventricular drainage. And in this case, we prefer to monitor the CSF quality instead of changing the external drainage. Great, thank you. Uh, did you recommend silver coat AVD in, uh, in children? Uh, Luca, there is a question from the floor. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I can because there is some papers that uh, tell us that VP shunt is not different uh, with uh, antibiotics or no, but a tendency in AVD, uh, I saw some papers that are for uh, impregnated catheter. Uh, yeah. Do you believe that make difference in these cases? 
So we, we tested both antibiotics implemented and the silver-coated catheters. So we didn't find a significant difference. Significant difference, and uh, I didn't find a statistically significant difference. Also in the papers I read. So we are okay with antibiotic impregnators. We try to use them, unless of course there is not a clear contraindication due to the, for example, uh, intolerance to the antibiotics that are used for this catheter. In this case, we use the silver coated. But we didn't find a significant advantage with the silver coated versus the antibiotic impregnated. Uh, as mentioned before, of course, we can uh, also rely on our own experience because uh, there are many centers that use uh, standard catheters, no silver coated, no antibiotic impregnated. They have a very low rate of infection. So also the the, 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 the technique you use to insert the shunt, the external drainage, and the, the, the checking of the dressing, the antibiotic prophylaxis and so on are important to prevent the infection, not only the type of the catheter. And I think some environments are also more problematic. Yeah, yeah. In talking with my friends around the country, pardon me, around the world that do uh, pediatric neurosurgery, some pediatric neurosurgery groups are more reluctant to place an external drain. And it may have to do with climate, warmth, uh, the associated bacteriologic profile of the skin, perspiration, all of these things. Um, I have some friends and colleagues in warm places that say we would rather have everything below the skin surface than something hanging out because our rates are high. Um, occasionally, even subgaleal shunts can get you out of trouble if you need to temporize, but I, I would never say that it's an adequate substitute. Can you comment, Luca, um, Tatiana, Nelsie, how many days, what's your max for an EVD? So <laughs> as less as possible, I would say, but of course, we have the same uh, attitude that Nelsie for the posterior fossa tumor. We wait at, at most uh, one week, then if the hydrocephalus disappears, it's okay. Otherwise, we go ahead with DTV. Uh, sometimes you have to, now we are having another case of infection and uh, the baby is uh, uh, carrying on with the external drainage for more, more than one month. In this case, we cannot choose. So uh, sometimes you cannot choose. So try to maintain the external drainage as less as possible, but be sure that the infection is healed before uh, going ahead with the shunt. So I don't have a, a, a number of days that uh, we try to maintain the shunt. We know the external drainage, sorry. We know that less than 10 days is a good option to avoid infection. Between 10 and 20 days, I mean, between two and three weeks, we have the maximum risk of infection. After the three or four weeks, the infection drops again. But there's not, of course, a good uh, reason to maintain an external drainage for one month, for example. Elsie, what do you think? Yes, uh, I, my mind it was changed DVD every 10, 15 days until 1998, when we spent three days together, three days, only hydrocephalus in Assisi, Italy, uh, with uh, Concesio di Rocco organized. Uh, every pediatric neurosurgeon at that time, I was uh, young, studying, but Professor Jones from Australia bring a case of several cases, neonatal case. He keep the AVD for 75 days without infection. And he 75. tells 75. And it, we were astonished with uh, this uh, paradigm because until there, uh, we change every uh, two weeks, one week, uh, the AVD. And since then, uh, we change our paradigm when we change our AVD. Because you tell us, Luca, that you have time to time one month uh, hospitalized child. We have time to time three to six months the same child. And uh, we saw in this morning in another, another webinar, five to 10 uh, neurosurgical procedure in the same child. How we decide to change AVD in two cases. One, we can't solve the infection because we are in the right antibiotics 
with the right doses, with the right children, with the right healthcare, and doesn't solve the problem three to five weeks. At this time, we decide together if we do only uh, AVD changement or if we add a ventricular lavage. In another way, if you are treating right patient, right child, right antibiotics, and the child just going worse, better CSF analysis, the child clinically not well, we decide at this moment, uh, if we have high level protein, we uh, do both uh, surgery together. We change the AVD, but at the same time, we uh, try to do a ventricular lavage. If it's uh, available, we put an impregnated catheter on these special, very special cases. It's very interesting. Uh, I think there is a trend toward exactly what Nelsie alludes to, which is to say, we all were being very meticulous, doing lots of tapping and things like that. And I think we've all moved back a little bit as far as allowing them to run a little bit longer, just don't touch them. Um, do I, let me pose this question because it's in the, in the questions rather than going on. How much routine CSF analysis do you do with an EVD? Tatiana, maybe you could lead, lead us, lead that part of the discussion and we'll, and we'll come all the way around. Do you, do you draw CSF off of a functioning EVD or do you leave it as a closed system? Well, uh, it depends on uh, why you put the EVD on. If it's a tumor, we will put the EVD, you will take CSF sample to have, you know, or uh, studies of pathology and uh, uh, culture uh, samples, but we don't do samples reg regularly to not, you know, invade a closed system. But if it is an infection, and uh, we have to know if uh, the infection is getting better or not. So uh, um, each two days, we will take CSF to see if the uh, infection is getting better or not, because not only culture uh, being negative, that means that the infection is going away and that everything's okay. Because sometimes we have repeatedly uh, CSF changing. We have a, a number of cells, uh, a high number of cells with polymorphonuclear, we have uh, is, um, lower glycosis and higher protein. So in these cases, we have repeated CSF uh, uh, biochemical changes it doesn't get better. So this is the time that we can think of changing the catheter again. So it depends if it is an infection or not. So she says tumor one time, infection every couple of days. Nelsi, Luca, what, what say you? So we do pretty the same. I mean, during the external drainage for an infection, each two or three days we check for the CSF. As mentioned by Tatiana, we have to be sure that the infection is doing better, that the antibiotic is the one, the right one that we uh, have choose. For the other cases, we try to perform a, each three or four days a checking of the CSF and uh, for sure before removing the, the external drainage. Twice a week, usually we have CSF analysis. Uh, we change if there is exceptional cases, but usually we have fixed day to, to have the CSF analysis. I, I agree with the, with the approach that's been outlined. The more infection I'm worried about, the more frequently we, we access it, but we're definitely moving away from accessing it just for our curiosity. If there's no sign of infection, we tend to, to, to leave it alone as a closed, very well tunneled uh, system. Um, there's a, a case in the question. Uh, Luca, do you want to take a look? I, can you see that from the, the very last question? A four-year-old boy, four-year-old boy with a middle fossa cranial cyst. He would insert a VP shunt but they saw bleeding 
They didn't insert a peritoneal catheter, no change in the brain. I guess that means that they had some bleeding when they put the ventricular catheter, but didn't see it on the post-op CT. Would you go ahead and continue to shunt? So uh, I didn't understand. It was a uh, um, Sylvian arachnoid cyst, I suppose. So yeah, I, I, I didn't understand why to place uh, a BP shunt or a shunt, and especially why to put a ventricular catheter. So my opinion in this case, if, if the cyst is symptomatic, that is in a minority of cases, we can go ahead first with endoscopic uh, fenestration if there is enough room for that, or microsurgical fenestration. Usually it is advised to use a shunt just in case of failure because of the complication in this case, especially the ghost uh, cyst syndrome and uh, to avoid also a CSF dependency. In this case, since they have uh, an intraoperative complication, but now there, are, there is no problem, if I correctly understood, I uh, wouldn't touch the, the cyst, or at least I wouldn't place the, the, the CSF shunt. Elsie or Tatiana, any comment? Yes, uh, I think the beginning, it was on the 80s, it was normal uh, to put a, a cystoperitoneal shunt uh, during my residence training. After my fellow uh, in pediatric neurosurgery, when I came back uh, in Brazil, uh, we changed the reality in the same hospital, just with uh, some literature, with uh, the, the boss open mind, and we just stopped doing uh, cysto peritoneal shunt for cyst. It was in, after 1995. And uh, for maybe 10 years, we just do a uh, membrane with a microscope. And after 2000, uh, we moved to uh, endoscopic approach. And today we decide maybe we go with the endoscope to do a fenestration, but we left in place uh, the microscope. If we need, we are ready to change uh, in another way. But we try to avoid uh, the, the Catheter shunt. inside, uh, yes, we try to avoid shunt. I, but I, during this procedure, if there is some bleeding, maybe it's better to try to look at and try to solve the problem uh, during the surgery and try to see. Usually uh, the arachnoidal cyst, we don't have uh, many bleeding. Maybe we are behind or something like that. Maybe it's better to, to see what's going on. I would emphasize the timeline that Nelsi just shared because I think it's really important because um, there was a time when cystoperitoneal shunts were regularly placed. And I think that observations over time around the world in different centers led ev pretty much everybody to the same place, which is to say, A, don't touch them if you don't have to and B, don't shunt them absolutely because you, I think you tend to get into a situation. There's something dynamic about these cysts, and while I don't think they cause a lot of headaches, and the majority of them can be law, can be probably observed, you can make one of the most headache dependent, shunt dependent, bad situations with arachnoid cysts. I hear that story again and again and again of people that placed a lot of arachnoid cysts, uh, catheters, in other words, cystoperitoneal shunts. If you're going to treat, take Luca's word, take Nelsie's word. I, I didn't ask Tatiana, but I suspect that's the same. Fenestrate, fenestrate, fenestrate. Tatiana's shaking her head just a little bit, but she's shaking her head. So I think she agrees. Fenestrate, right? Avoid treating them if you don't have to. Those have, they, 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 they have a lot of problems and complications and it's rare that you take a symptomatic patient and make them asymptomatic. But don't shunt unless you have to because you will create a significant number of very unhappy, very headachey patients. That's, I think that's the consensus that a lot of groups came to 
between the 1980s and now. <clears throat> Tatiana, you have any comment? Yes, uh, I agree, of course. I, I think uh, arachnoid cysts, uh, middle fossa arachnoid cysts is the big uh, subject with a lot of controversial in the literature uh, 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 and it's difficult to treat. Everybody knows the slide of Professor Duroco that Luca Massimi is used to, was used to see that it started with microsurgery and you go, you go, you have a bleeding and it ends in a shunt. Uh, so it's a, a really difficult um, pathology to treat. Uh, we prefer in our department to perform microsurgery and not um, endoscopy because we have a lot of arachnoid adhesions to pass through. And sometimes uh, this is difficult, but sometimes bleedings uh, can happen in the post-operative time. And that's when you, at the end, put an EVD or after a shunt, but the shunt uh, should be avoided. So uh, Nelson, we're at the top of the hour. There are a couple of questions left, but we're at the top of the hour. We've tried to be disciplined on our time. How would you like to proceed? Uh, just remind the audience that if they would like to have the certificate, they need to fill the MCQ questions. Linda will keep open uh, the webinar for 20 minutes uh, from now. And uh, we may try to answer more one or two questions for that doesn't run uh, too, uh, too much out of our time. And just remind uh, the audience that uh, this webinar are recording. We will be available on ISPN Neurosurgery website in a few days or maybe next week will be available with uh, Professor Sandeep Chatterjee uh, lecture about uh, neonatal, uh, there is a very important point and different that we uh, discussed today. It's important uh, to, so, to see this uh, conference. Yes. I would, I would just add one uh, comment to what Nelsie just said. Do, uh, Dr. Or Professor Chatterjee is a masterful speaker and has um, dedicated his life to pediatric neurosurgery. He has great wisdom and great experience and he's a wonderful speaker. So the, the, his talk is recorded and will be available for you. I would highly recommend that anyone who has time and inclination circle back and listen to that because he's really quite, quite outstanding. Uh, did you have some uh, question to answer before the final remarks? Uh... There was a question about arrested hydrocephalus. Is that something, is that a concept that you recognize? And if so, how do you make that diagnosis? Do you ever take a shunt out? Do you, anything like that? I think those are the, those are the things that flow from a question on arrested hydrocephalus. Just a comment uh, uh, happened a few months ago in Sao Paulo, in another hospital. Uh, a child have two VP shunts and the mom was in the neurosurgeon and tell the surgeon, there is something that is hurting my child here. Just took out one of the shunt because it doesn't work anymore. And it was done in a week after the child was dead. Uh, for me, arrested hydrocephalus, if you have a VP shunt, even if the catheter is broken, don't touch, give them with the VP shunt there. Uh, I think we can save lives. Uh, it's a big subject to try to, if I found uh, a broken VP shunt and with a fracture, if we change or not, but arrested hydrocephalus with VP shunt, I don't believe. I In another side, is difficult to deal if you have uh, a hydrocephalus or uh, an important ventricular dilatation without clinical signs in an older child. I think we need to, to look around with uh, ophthalmological evaluation, with uh, MRI signs to try to don't 
entry in a cascade of events if the child's oligosymptomatic or no symptomatic at all. But I would like to hear from Tatiana and Luca and Jeff about your thoughts on the very difficult subject for me. Well, I, I don't I don't believe also in arrested hydrocephalus and I had a, an experience during my master's degree that I reviewed uh, 251 uh, uh, papers from uh, uh, children in the hospital. So uh, with my yellow meningo cell and 10 patients had uh, a, a fracture in the catheter and they were just, you know, ah, nothing to do, uh, the shunt doesn't work. From these 10 patients, all of them, during 18 years of follow-up, they arrived in the hospital one time or another uh, with a shunt dysfunction, two of them in a coma. Yep. So after that, uh, all the catheters there are fractured because we also had, we try to see what is going on when you reveal this, uh, this shunt. So try to open in uh, uh, the abdomen and uh, look uh, the distal catheter, the CSF will flow, will not flow in a big volume, but it flows uh, inside this fibrosis. So uh, what do we do now when we have a fracture, uh, if uh, the patient has a good access to the hospital? And, uh, you know, the family, it's okay. It's, uh, they know what to do if a symptom is present. So we can uh, observe, but you usually doing uh, fundoscopy, uh, MRI, and uh, the fo near follow-up of these children. But if not, if the access is not okay, we perform a revision, even though we don't have a, a symptomatic patient because this can save lives. Luca? Yes, totally agree. We can consider arrested hydrocephalus in preterm babies, but of course, in this case, we should use properly the term of ventriculomegaly. So some preterm babies do not develop actually an hydrocephalus or sometimes the hydrocephalus regresses, but they are not shunted, never shunted patients. Totally agree with Tatiana and Elsie about the shunted patients. They still continue draining with the scarring around the catheters. Sometimes also in the subcutaneous tissue, there is a, especially in myelomeningocil patients, just a, they need a small amount of drainage. But if you remove the shunt, you can really um, put the patients in, in troubles. So totally agree with them. What about so, you, Jeff? <clears throat> so what the student should hear is the same thing I was alluding to before. The same observation at different places at different centers around the globe. The concept of arrested hydrocephalus is a dangerous one. And if shunts are removed with every good intent, it will result in fatalities, period. Not every case. But, and you won't be able to predict it. One of, when I was a resident, one of the students where I did my residency looked at this and found that more than a third of cases that were taken out when the attending surgeon said the hydrocephalus is arrested, more than a third of cases came back and that a significant percentage of them came back in trouble, either in coma or worse. And there were deaths in that series as well. There is no question that the clinical experience of experienced centers is that taking shunts out is highly dangerous. The tracts conduct spinal fluid. The amount of flow may be small that's needed, but the patient's life hinges on it. Exercise extreme restraint and great caution ever removing a shunt. It's not a good idea. There will be deaths. Not every patient, but there will be deaths. So that's the... It seems to be the consistent observation around different groups around the world. Oh, Thanks. sorry. There's, yeah, there's we some raised hands. 
Yeah. Yes, we have three hazed hands. Maybe we can give one minute each just to, to manifest it. Did you agree, Linda, with us? Uh, I know we are running uh, 10 minutes uh, our time. No, sure, no problem. Okay, thank you very much, dear. Maybe uh, a quick word, please, uh, two minutes each, and we just uh, finalize this webinar. Emaka Okorie, Emeka, please. Yes, you can talk. I, I, I just enjoyed um, the, uh, the, the talk on uh, hydrocephalus, um, basically. It has uh, really opened my eyes um, in the, the management of this lesion, um, especially as we commonly see them um, here in Nigeria. But um, I thank all the speakers for their talk. Thanks. Thank Thanks you. a lot, Emeka. We are happy to have Nigeria with us. Thanks for your comments, and we enjoy to, to have you with us. Please, Emmanuel Batista Geraldino. Yes, Emmanuel. Are you listening us? Uh, open your mic. Uh, your microphone is uh, closed. Can you? Un yes, you to yourself. Yeah. Yes, please. So say thank you for everywhere. Uh, that was, was amazing. Uh, the experience of yours uh, about hydrocephalus ATV. I just uh, asked something about the solution. Here in Brazil, uh, some people use plasma, plasma lights uh, by the complication uh, for a saline solution. Can you help me please explaining, explaining us something about, about that? Yes, just some words. Uh, if you don't have a uh, range uh, simple to use on ATV, we use uh, saline solution, yes, because uh, if it's not available, we use a normal saline solution. Did you agree with uh, the statement, uh, Jeff, Luca, and Tatiana? Yes, of course. Yes. Okay. Thank, thank you, Emmanuel, for being with us. <clears throat> please, uh, last comment, Ana Maria Rosas, please, Suarez. Unmute yourself, Ana Maria, please. You still muted, are you listeners? Can you try to unmute yourself, uh, Ana Maria? Mm -hmm. Meantime, I just remind you that uh, the next webinar, the module three, will be uh, on August 26, uh, will be spine malformations, anatomy, diagnosis and treatment. Spina bifida will be a great pleasure to have you all with us and remind that this uh, recording will be available soon. And I can see your mic unmute, Ana Maria. You may uh, give our uh, the final words, Tatiana, Jeffrey, Luca, and Nor Maria. Uh, um, so Ma you can go, Maria. 
Lena, please, uh, Tatiana, please proceed with your final words. Your lecture was amazing and very interesting. Thank you so much for the wonderful lectures, everyone. I'm really pleased to be a part of this amazing course and I've been listening to all the wonderful discussion and every question that has been asked by the audience and uh, everything that we discussed. It was so amazing and uh, it was uh, lovely to uh, listen to everything and to compare it with our own setups where we actually, like I was enjoying the Chabra talk because here in Pakistan, we do have Chabra. Uh, we appreciate still being performed and um, obviously we have seen both of them but we would still use chabra shirts because uh, in public sector sometimes the government indents these shirts for us uh, to provide free of cost and obviously we are a limited income country and when we have seen its complications obviously but uh, in uh, pediatric cases they usually prefer uh, these chabra shirts because the skin is thinner and they say that it's much better to use this so we have actually uh, used both of them and um, uh, and like you have said the literature the discussion on, about the literature is very, very interesting all these things different results and everything it's the beauty of neurosurgery i think it's very dynamic so again thank you so much this has been a really interesting and informative session for each and every one of us whatever um whoever whether it was a student or a junior neurosurgeon so again i'm really grateful to uh, professor nelsi who has um, come up with all these amazing talks and everything there. So I think this is my <laughs> remarks on this. Thank you very much, Nor Maria. Tatiana? Well, thank you uh, everybody for the invitation. I think this changing of information and protocols in different places in the, in the world uh, is very important. As Maria said, uh, sometimes we have cost problems in hospitals and choose the best shunt or the best uh, uh, device is difficult, but having the information, the changing, how can you choose, how can you base scientifically to explain why you are asking for a device or not the other, it's uh, important. So uh, it was a real pleasure to participate and share uh, with you our experience and learn a lot from you. Thank you. Thank you, Tatiana. Please, Luca. As I joined the comment of the student before, I believe we need this kind of uh, meetings and it's important not only for the students, but also for us to share our uh, um, information. I really appreciated, for example, some concept that Jeff provided us about the sulcation disorder. So the solution you used, uh, you and uh, Tatiana, uh, for uh, some types of hydrocephalus. So good ideas. It's important also for me to learn. So thank you all and keep on doing ahead with that. Thank you, Luca. Jeff, the floor is yours. Well, I think it's been a great session. I would uh, invite the students' attention to areas where you heard the same thing told from different perspectives. We didn't meet before to come together with common answers. So where you've heard the same thing from different centers, specifically, once a shunt, always a shunt. Arrested hydrocephalus, dangerous concept. We're moving away from treating arachnoid cysts aggressively. Don't shunt them if you don't have to. If they're really big and symptomatic, think fenestration, endoscopic, things like this, if, if you have that available. It's been a wonderful session. I appreciate the active involvement of the audience, both in the posted questions and in the verbal questions. I think it's been another very, very good session. And we, look, we hope and look forward to seeing many of you at the next one of these sessions. Thank you very much for the speakers, Tatiana, Luca, Albert. Uh, thanks a lot, Jeffrey, Nor Maria for helping. Special thanks, gratitude, Linda, for all your help every Yay, hour Linda. we meet. Yay. And the audience, thanks for being with us. More than 100 people on this last, uh, last two, two hours it is fantastic, fantastic. You are the reason that we are here. Thank you That's very exactly much. Right. And see you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank Thank you. you.